Okay, this is Scott Bozarth for Sonora Desert Institute, FTT 100, Introduction to Firearms, Instructor Randy Stewart. This is my week eight final project. So on the bench, we have a Remington Model 4. If you can see that, that's a, a Model 4 spelled out, F-O-U-R. There's another Model 4, the number 4, Remington Model 4, which is actually a rolling block Remington uh, rim fire from the late 1800s. While I may wish that that's what I had on my bench, um, this is still a pretty special rifle. So the Model 4 um, is basically Remington's third iteration of the Woodmaster. You had the 740 and the 742 that followed, and then the 7400 and Model 4 are this generation. This is actually a Remington Model 7400. Um, from 1982, you, this was your step up. The Model 4 was your fancy 7400. It had the, the nice wood, um, the nice finish, all that. Oh, it even came with this fancy little uh, brass inlay telling you what it was chambered in. That's, this is a 30 6 Springfield. We get it in 270 Winchester, 280 Remington, uh, 308. They had a shorter action version in 308. And in this took me some digging. 8 millimeter, no, 7 millimeter Remington Express. 8 millimeter Remington, 7 millimeter Remington Express. Do you know what that was? That was the 280 Remington. Why it was the 7 millimeter Remington Express advertised, I don't know. I couldn't figure that out. Uh, but be that as it may, this is a 30 6 version. I have the original mag for it. And then, as I was showing you earlier, a, um, I believe this is a 280 Remington mag out of a for a model modern model 7400 you can tell the difference this is probably the dark days of remington this is 1982 remington you know when they were really really doing it um with their model 700 their 870 all the other model sevens there are a lot of great remingtons from the 80s that we don't have anymore but anyway so this what we have here is model four um i was saying about the 740 and the 742, if you can see in here, this rifle is a, is a semi-automatic gas tappet. It's got a kind of a bizarre rail system that it rides in. We'll, we'll take a look at that. Um, a rotating bolt, if you can see, a semi-automatic rifle. And basically, the way it works, it works like any other gas blowback. Um, I can just start taking this thing apart. As a matter of fact, we'll field strip it and I can explain as we go. Um, gas block, gas port, gas block in here that blows into the tappet. There is a uh, tube, gas tube with a, a recoil spring around it all in here. And then it's got two guides that it rides across and the bolt is attached to those. In order to get the bolt out, you've got to take the barrel off. It's a whole thing. So, me not wanting to mess this rifle up, um, I started out with the intentions of taking it completely apart and um, just to see if I could, because I was intimidated by this rifle. You know, I remember this thing sitting in my grandpa's gun safe when I was single digits. You know, I, I was born in 83, so this rifle's, you know, a year older than I am. I just always remember it being there. The story of this rifle, my dad's cousin bought it in Fairbanks, Alaska. He bought it for his son. Uh, one reason or other, they didn't want it. Sold it to my dad. My dad bought it for his dad, my grandpa, who had broken his shoulder the year before, still wanted to go elk hunting, just hunting period. 
And so my dad thought, hey, a semi-automatic 30-06, that might recoil nice and soft and still pack a punch. I'm here to tell you, it doesn't recoil all that soft. It's a little softer than a bolt action. So here, this foregrip is, is pretty nice. We do have a, a pretty visible crack. Um, I've got still pictures from my week seven project. There it is. Yeah, pretty visible crack right there. I think this can be fixed. I don't I don't think it needs to be fully repaired right now. I don't intend to, to use this rifle so much as just store it and, and take care of it. But eventually that's going to need to be addressed. I'm assuming with some acre glass or something like that. But currently I don't think I possess the skills to do that. Hopefully I learned that at Sonoran Desert Institute. Um, so here's the cap. You could tell somebody used the wrong size screwdriver. I like to use these hollow ground, you know, to get in there. Um, my dad put this stainless washer on here in his attempt to make this thing actually shoot. It's, it is a one and a half MOA rifle on its best day. And I think that's just all it was ever intended to be. The purists out there are going to moan and groan and say that has to come off of there, but he did increase accuracy with it. And aside from dissimilar metals corroding and it's not original, well, you know, this is a family rifle and my dad put that on there, so I'm just going to leave it. All right, so from here, we need to... I'm going to put this thing in my gun vise here. Okay. So this is fairly simple. Once we get into it, now I had to figure this out the hard way and by using poor documentation because all that I could find for this rifle was the Remington 7400 uh, owner's manual documentation, everything from Remington because they never made a Model 4, according to them, who I called. Uh, it always shipped with a 7400 owner's manual. So, that's what I had to go off of. Um, I need a bench block or something, a vice. I need a lot of things. Okay, so what we just did, we punched out that roll pin that goes through the gas block. There's our roll pin here. You can see it there. And if I slide this back, this retainer clip comes off. I'm not gonna tell you how many times I had to take this thing apart before I figured it out. But however many times that was, I'm still not able to just nail it on the first try. So, you got to kind of have three hands here. Because as you take this gas tube out, that functionally is holding your recoil spring, which seats inside the barrel nut. And then... Again, because I don't have the right documentation, I don't know the exact word for this, slide housing, what would you even call this? And the spring rides in there, and then you'll see the gas tube, or I'm sorry, the gas block there. Try and turn that so you can see what we're doing. Gas tube goes over the gas block. It's pretty smart easy simple design the uh bullet passes your gas block you have a really long dwell time if you notice 
think about an AR with a 16 inch barrel or something like that, 16 and a, and a half. You've got, depending on what gas system you're running, I think I'm running a carb rifle length on mine, two, three inches, not very much. This, your gas block is clear back here. It's a 22 inch barrel. Without pulling out a tape, I would guess that at 14 inches. So all that gas pressure before the bullet leaves the muzzle is blowing into this gas tube. It looks like these holes are here too. And that would explain why the inside of the foregrip is so sooty and built up with carbon. I didn't clean this on purpose. I couldn't find any, I didn't know how to go about it because if you damage this inside sleeve, see how thin this wood is? Okay, if I damage whatever's inside of here, I know some cases it's fiberglass, this it looks like it's at least a sheet metal type of sleeve or something, but I don't, I don't know, I didn't wanna risk it, not knowing enough, so I didn't wanna clean this up too much because I was afraid of messing up the wood. Uh, and it's honestly not that bad. There's a little bit of, can you see that? A little bit of green, like copper. Anyway, I digress. Point is, gas is going everywhere inside that foreign. I've never shot this thing enough to know if, if you were to, I don't know, it's only got a four round mag and I've got two mags for it. So if you were to mag dump both of those in a hurry, how hot would that foregrip get? Probably pretty screaming hot, but that's not the point of this rifle. So, next step in our field strip is to drift out these pins that are holding our... Be very careful here. holding our fire control group or our trigger assembly inside the receiver. I apologize for the length of this video. I'm not a YouTuber. I don't know how to edit. So you're just getting live stream of consciousness. So on the plus side, you'll know if I have to edit it, if I screw it up. All right, I think I left this thing. I should have said before we started, again, not a YouTuber. I'm brand new at this. This rifle is clear and safe, obviously. I'm not beating on a loaded rifle, but I should have said that before uh, getting underway here. So our whole trigger group comes out, and a lot of folks will say, hey, that looks like an 870 trigger. Well, it kind of does. Um I did take this trigger all apart, and I'll just do a quick little explanation here. Um, this, let's see, can you see that? There's a clip in here that has to pop out. Out comes this pin, which is actually holding the trigger mechanism in place. There's a pin here that's driven out and there's a spring inside with a tiny ball bearing that seats your safety, all right? That positive detent clicking from, uh, clicking your safety off and on is from a, a small little ball bearing held in place by a spring. That was pretty cool. Um, so out comes this pin and this big C-clip, or I mean, uh, um, geez, roll pin, sorry comes out, out and out will slide your trigger. Um, the sear, let's see, as we're taking this apart, you wanna make sure you hold the hammer in place, press it down, pull your trigger so that the sear releases the trigger and you don't just go launching that off because the trigger, under the trigger is the trigger spring, which is actually this cylinder, which is held in place by this piece, um, which is part of the caulking mechanism, has a big spring underneath of it. And I know this because as I took it apart, this piston came off and shot out and hit me right in the forehead. 
and I was happy to catch it in the forehead because then it fell on my bench and didn't go skyrocketing across the room never to be seen again. So I count myself fortunate there. Uh, trigger spring, which pushes up onto the sear. I read in a couple forums that you can put a, a lighter spring here. The, this trigger is not great. It's not terrible, but it's like good BB gun trigger. It's not great. It's not bolt action great. It's not even uh, Remington 700, which, well, you know, that's kind of the standard of a Depends on who you talk to, of what a good trigger should feel like, but it's not that bad. Um, but I hesitate to get in and polish it for the same reason as I, I just don't want to mess with this rifle um, any more than I need to. So I took it apart. I cleaned it up really good. Uh, hit it with this Spartan Accuracy oil that came in the lab kit. Uh, I read decent stuff about it. There's not a lot of information. Um, if not that, I... You know, the old standby. I like this applicator. This is why I use this more than anything, because of this applicator bottle. It's excellent. All right. Uh, I'm not going to do it here for time's sake, but I did pull off those two Phillips screws to pull the uh, butt plate off. And inside of there is a flathead screw that holds the butt stock to the receiver. Um, I did take it off and inspect it, and those photos are in the week seven assignment, I believe, with six or seven. Um, and it doesn't have any cracks or anything. It actually looks really good. So that's all nice. Now here's where we ran into a problem. In order for me to continue with this and take this bolt out, now this was for cleaning. Um, you can see there's some buildup Maybe you can't see. All right. There's some buildup in here, and I wanted to get it, but I couldn't because I couldn't take the bolt out. Why couldn't I take the bolt out? Well, if you see in here, right there, can we see that? That light-colored pin. That pin has to be drifted from the top down. is right there okay so I used the only two punches I have that would fit that these two and I managed to get them straightened out but I tell you what I had them both just completely bent I hit this thing as hard as I was willing to hit this old rifle uh, you know, I've drifted a good amount of, fair amount of pins. I'm not a gunsmith, but, you know, I was hitting this thing pretty hard. I went so far as to soak it in WD-40 overnight. Uh, nothing. I went looking for croil. All I could find was ballastol. So I tried this. Again, 24-hour soak. Nothing. It wouldn't come out. Um, and I tried regular hoppies number nine. One thing I didn't do that I wanted to was to apply heat to this. And I wasn't sure until driving home today from work, which is while I'm shooting this is when I'm shooting this right now, one o'clock in the morning. I, if I, so I have a, um, map gas torch, you know, the yellow bottle torch. I don't want to hit that because this dust protector which is the original dust protector and is plastic so i'm not i don't want to hit any of it and i don't want to i don't know what's going to do to the bluing and everything so i don't want to hit this with a torch i have a um heat gun you know like a souped up hair dryer that thing gets pretty hot maybe six seven hundred degrees i would think i don't know what that would do to the finish it would probably not be great for this plastic so I didn't use that either. And then as I was driving home, I thought, what if I were to put a soldering iron on that thing? I have a butane soldering iron, but maybe I could borrow from work or something. Somebody's got a high temp proper, like a Weller good industrial soldering iron. And I got that sucker, the tip down in there and only heated up the pin 
Some of it's going to get into the bolt, but that's fine. So that's my plan to try that in order. I still want to get this bolt out. What I did to clean it in the meantime was um, I used this Spartan Carbon Destroyer. I actually like this stuff. I So what I had originally used was regular Hoppies number nine solvent, right? On the brush, got in there, scrubbed and scrubbed and scrubbed, and all the carbon creates like a goo. You know, I'm sure anyone who's cleaned a gun knows what I'm talking about. And um, you can't get it all the way out with nothing more than, you know, you can't get a rag in there, can't get this stupid bolt out. So I hit it with that, I'd hit it with the oil, and then I was messing around and I saw this carbon destroyer stuff is, it's like water consistency and it is water based. So I just turned the rifle and sprayed it with this stuff, scrubbed it some more, sprayed it again. Man, it washed most of that carbon right out. And then I used some um, rubbing alcohol, you know, rinsed it out a little more and it looked pretty good. So. Uh, then I oiled it up. I used that accuracy oil. We'll see how that does. And uh, then I'm not going to, I don't know how to transfer my bore scope. I have one of those test long bore scopes, which was an excellent purchase and it works really well, but I don't know how to feed it into this phone that I'm filming this on. I do it on my laptop. I'm not, I'm a technician. I'm the least tech savvy electronics technician you'll ever meet so i just need to figure out how to do it because it would be pretty cool anyway so uh, normally when you're cleaning a rifle or any gun you like to come in from the uh bore side from the um sorry it's very late from the not the muzzle <laughs> side the breech side uh with this rifle, I couldn't really, you can't really do that. You know, it's like a 1022 or sometimes you, you just can't get in there. But I do have carbon fiber cleaning rod. So um, I just went in through the muzzle, trying to get this in there. Uh, I used my nylon brush. I've switched from the phosphor bronze ones to these nylon um, I don't know. They just seem to last longer. And I get a little obsessive. I ran it through maybe 15 times or so, reapplying Carbon Destroyer. Um, and then I will patch it with, uh, I've got a jag here. Get my 30 caliber jag on there um, and just run patches through until they come out clean. Um, and Again, now that I have the bore scope, I would usually would go through another batch of cleaning. And now that I have that bore scope, it this thing looks great. It was super clean. So I ran an oily patch through it and then another clean patch behind that. And everything was hunky-dory. And I put it back together, which I think I'm going to spare you because this is probably already a long enough video. Um... But you saw how easily it came apart. It's really not that hard to put back together. Hardest part, we'll do the hardest part here. The hardest part, if anyone for the archives, someday when I'm a famous YouTuber for Sonoran Desert Institute, putting this gas tube in here first, okay? This part, this recoil spring is not fun, okay? Uh, like you needed three hands to take it apart, you kind of need them to put it back together. But once you get the hang of it, you got it around the gas tube, you get it seated into the barrel nut, and then very carefully, you just work it onto that gas tube. Okay, don't let go of that spring because it will shoot right into your eyeball and you only get two of those. If you're lucky. All right. Take your time. Somebody's gonna watch this and go, there's a way better way. 
or Brownells or somebody says, oh, there's a special tool for that. Look, this is what I figured out. Oh no, we came unseated. Well, the video was going so well. I had you fooled, didn't I? You thought I knew what I was doing. All right, get you in there. Okay, all right, okay, okay. So, we're not done yet. We've got to get our little bracket on here. I always forget how, how in the world. Nice final project there, Bozarth. Yeah, well. Anybody that works on guns or works on cars, they know. You see this sort of stuff, you know. It's maybe you've done it a million times and it never quite wants to play right every time. All right, before we cover it up, we got our roll pin. Get that started. Now what you can you can mess this up. You can mess this up. I know. Ask me how I know. I uh, shoved that roll pin two hooks just like that. Just did it again. See how it just barely misses the uh, the hole on its way through. Didn't do it that bad that time, but man, I sure got it good the first go around. I'm sure that sounds terrible on the camera. Sorry about that. Not a professional YouTuber. Okay. And from there, it's just on with the forend. Get our uh, trigger group in there. It should mention it. It's got to be cocked to go in there. It's just how it is. Uh, whatever. Let's just do it. It just takes a second. All right. smaller pin they they kind of dummy proof it for you you've got the larger pin larger diameter pin goes in the back just above the safety and then this smaller pin all right forehand has to go on and then slide down be gentle with this old wood Dad's stainless steel washer rides again. Let's see, Let's see if I take that off or not. The man knows how to make a rifle shoot. He just does. And if he says that, tighten up the groups, then I believe him. I'm not going to shoot this thing enough. Uh, I've got one other 30-06. I love the 30-06. I'm surprised I don't have a whole, you know, gang of them hanging on my wall. But all I've got is this one and a... Uh, Montgomery Wards or Sears 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 52 something or other made by Winchester it's a Winchester Model 70 uh, post 64 but you know uh, push feed but it's cool and it shoots lights out and it has an awesome trigger on it that I'm pretty sure my dad did we'll put our mag in there just to demonstrate all right, this rifle does have a last round hold open feature, um, which is kind of silly because as soon as you dump, as soon as you drop your mag, it's held back by the magazine. Here's your bolt release. Okay, as soon as you release your mag, oh geez, 
Did he put it back together right? Put the bite down. Yeah, uh, see, I had you fooled. Had you fooled. You thought I knew what I was doing. Well, folks, that's the end of our final exam. Maybe with a broken rifle. Okay, so now I'm not convinced that that magazine works in this machine here. Let's try one more time. Bolt holds back. Now this should be the mag release, which is, I mean, I'm sorry, the bolt release. There it goes. Okay. Okay. Well, I don't know why it got all crazy on us a second ago, but there it is. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. We got some bluing problems there that came about by this. I don't think it's a loophole scope mount, but yeah, it caused some corrosion under there. So hopefully in the next class, um, the SDI offers, I got sent some, some Caldwell perma blue and some stuff that looks like maybe there'll be some bluing in the next lab. So maybe I can fix this in our next class. Anyway, this is Scott Bozarth, uh, FDT 100, SDI, Introduction to Firearms, Week 8 Final Project. Uh, Mr. Stewart's been fun. Thank you very much. Learned a ton. And uh, I hope to see you guys some more with uh, SDI. All right. Thanks.